Welcome to this video on the condition number of a matrix. So the topic we are considering is solving linear systems. We have a matrix A, a right hand side vector B, and we are trying to find the vector X such that AX equals B. Now the question that I would like to address is say that either the matrix or the right hand side vector, so either A or B, contain small errors. So for instance, you have uh, measurements that constitute your linear uh, system, or maybe you form the linear system by doing some simulations, and small errors will occur in your matrix and right hand side. How does that influence the solution X? So if the matrix has a certain relative error, or the B vector has a certain relative error, how does it change X? This will lead to a concept which is called the condition number of a matrix. So we will derive that. And then I will indicate that the condition number is also a measure for whether a matrix is non-singular or not. So you know from linear algebra by hand, by doing exact arithmetic, that you can find out whether a matrix has an inverse or not by computing the determinant. Well, it will become clear that the determinant, the, the size of the determinant, whether this is a big or a small number, that that is not really a good indication for singularity of a matrix. The condition number is. So we will show that. And finally, for the two norm, the two matrix norm, we will give some formulas for the condition number. So let's see. Um, the idea is this. So we're trying to solve a linear system, AX equals B, A and B are given, and now I'm going to assume that A and B both have small errors, and we are interested in insensitivity. So we have some perturbations, A and B are perturbed. How does that influence the solution vector X? So let us say that we have a matrix delta A. So delta A is a matrix of the same size as A. And every entry is, is a small perturbance, a small error in the entries of A. And similarly, we have a vector delta B, which is the errors in, in B as a vector. And then we're interested to find what is delta X. So what we have is that X plus delta X is the solution of the perturbed linear system. So the linear system with A plus delta A as a matrix, B plus delta B as a right-hand side vector. Now, I'm just multiplying, so A times X, A times delta X, delta A times X, delta A, delta X. A, X, and B are the same, that's the exact solution, so I can cross these. And then this term, delta A, delta X, if we assume that all these entries are small, say 10 to the power minus 8, for instance, then if you take the product, they're much, much smaller, 10 to the power minus 16. So we are going to neglect these. And if I leave them out of the equation, I am going to write an equal sign with a dot here. So the dot denotes that we threw away the higher order terms and only include the first order terms. So this is the equation that we then have. And I can solve that for delta x. This is theoretical analysis. So I write A inverse here. That's not the way we would compute it. Um, so we have this here for delta x. So let's copy that to the next slide and take norms. So then we have that the norm of delta x, so the norm of the error, the absolute error in the solution is less or equal and then we have this here in the right hand side and I'm going to manipulate that a bit because what I would like to aim for is an expression for the relative error in the solution so that is absolute error divided by the norm of x is the relative error in the solution and I would like to have that in terms of the relative error in my matrix. And the relative error in my right hand side vector. So what I will try to do is manipulate this inequality in such a way that I can, can relate these relative errors somehow. So how can we do that? 
what I'm going to do is I am going to um, divide first of all by the norm of x. So here we then have the relative error in x, so that's great. And then here on the right, well, this is just what it was before, but I've divided by uh, the norm of x. And if I now divide this here by the norm of a, then I have the relative error, but of course I cannot simply only divide by the norm of a, then I would also have to multiply by it. So this is already a bit nicer, because here, I, so forget about this term for a second. Here I have the relative error in my matrix, and apparently that is being multiplied with this number here, norm of a inverse times norm of a, to get the relative error in the solution. So that's great. Um, happy about that one. This one is still a bit ugly, but we can make that better. So what I do is I say, well, I know that b equals ax, so the norm of b is the norm of ax, and then I can use the uh, inequality that holds for matrix norms, and I can can have this inequality. And then if you write it the other way around, you see that apparently one over the norm of a norm of a times norm of x is less or equal one over norm of b. So what I can do here in this uh, term here, I can replace the denominator using this inequality. So what do we have then? What we find is this inequality, and this is perfect. So let, let's let's look a little bit closer at what it says here. We'll do that on the next slide. So let's see, what have we found? Here on the left of the inequality, we have the relative error in the solution, the relative error in x. Then here in between the brackets, the first term is the relative error in our matrix, and the second term is the relative error in the right-hand side vector. And apparently both of these are being multiplied with this box number here. So this box number, the norm of A inverse times the norm of A, that tells us how either errors in the matrix or errors in the right-hand side vector, um, how they end up in the solution. So with which number they're being multiplied for the error in the solution of the linear system. So this number is important and it has a name. It's called the condition number. And for any non-singular square matrix, you can define it. So it's C-O-N-D for condition number, and it's the norm of A inverse times the norm of A. So let's first look at a few properties here, or properties. First of all, notation. It depends a little bit on the textbook or the paper that you read, which notation they use. So kappa, Greek letter kappa, is also often used for condition number. I wasn't very spe specific about the norm we use here. It can be the two norm, the one norm, the infinity norm, and all of these will give you a different condition number. So since two matrix norms, one norm and the two norm, they are different, um, the condition number will also depend on the matrix norm that you use. What you also see is if you have an induced matrix norm, then we know that norm of A inverse times norm of A is bigger equal the norm A inverse A, which is the identity matrix, and that is one. So apparently a condition number is always bigger equal one. So one is like the perfect condition number in the sense that if you have an error in your matrix, you will have the same relative error in your solution. And finally, from the definition, you see it's symmetric in A and A inverse. So the condition number of A equals the condition number of A inverse. Now, for square matrices, this condition number is also a measure for singularity. So what does that mean? It means that if you have a very big condition number, 10 to the power 12 or whatever, then your matrix is nearly singular. And if it is close to 1, so 1 is the lowest it can be, if it is close to 1, it means that A is easy to invert, far from being singular, something like that. And the rule of thumb is if your condition number is 10 to the power k, then in your computation, when solving the linear system, you lose k digits of accuracy. So if your matrix is accurate, say with an accuracy 10 to the power minus 10, pretty accurate, but your condition number is 10 to the power 6, then your solution, you should only trust 
10 to the power 6 times 10 to the power minus 10, which is 10 to the power minus 4. Only four digits of your solution are accurate. Now, we've already studied orthogonal matrices before. So matrices Q for which the columns form an orthonormal system. And we have seen that they have length 1 in the 2 norm. So the 2 norm of an orthogonal matrix is 1. The inverse, Q inverse, is Q transpose. So that has the same norm. Um, and that means that apparently an orthogonal matrix has condition number 1. So for numerical purposes, they're ideal in the sense that you don't lose accuracy when working with orthogonal matrices. Now, finally, the determinant is not a very good measure for singularity. So by hand, you would compute the determinant, check whether it is zero. Numerically, that doesn't work well. And why is that true? Well, let's look at a very simple example. So I'm going to look at a matrix that has one diagonal and all the diagonal is the, is the value alpha and I'll choose alpha to be a positive number. Then you can easily see that it's non-singular and the inverse is one over alpha times the identity. Now the condition number tells you that you can easily invert this matrix or easily solve a linear system with this matrix. Because the norm of A, a times the norm of A inverse, that's alpha times 1 over alpha equals 1. So the perfect condition number, the best you can get. But if you look at the determinant, you get alpha to the power n. Now, if alpha is in between 0 and 1, it means that alpha to the power n can be arbitrarily small, depending on the size of the matrix. And if you take alpha to be bigger than 1, say alpha is 2, then you get 2 to the power n, and you can let it grow as large as you would like. Last bit for this presentation, the relation to condition number and singular value. So if you have a non-singular matrix, then the two condition number, so this only holds for the two condition number, equals the largest uh, singular value, sigma 1 over sigma n. So how can we see this? Well, we have already seen in a previous video that the two norm of a matrix is equal to the square root of the spectral radius of A transpose A. Well, those um, eigenvalues are sigma 1 squared, sigma 2 squared, up to sigma n squared, the singular value squared of the matrix. So that apparently equals sigma 1. Similarly, A inverse, you can use that definition and you get the spectral radius of A minus transpose and A minus 1. So A minus transpose is the transpose of A inverse or the inverse of the transpose, that's the same matrix. Um, and you can easily see that if a lambda is an eigenvalue of A, A transpose, then 1 over lambda the, is, an, is an eigenvalue of its inverse. So what we find here is that apparently A, A transpose inverse, so that's, that's basically the matrix that's in here, has the eigenvalues 1 over sigma 1 squared, 1 over sigma 2 squared, and so on. So the singular values squared and then the inverse. Which means that apparently this is going to be the biggest one because sigma n squared is the smallest one. So what we have is that a inverse 2 norm is going to be 1 over sigma n. And we see that the condition number of the product is sigma 1 over sigma n. Now, the interesting thing is, first of all, this is a way to compute the condition number. And the other thing is that if you have a non-square matrix, so say that we have A of size M times N with M bigger than N, so more rows than columns, then we can still define the condition number like this. And we will be using that for least squares problems, which is uh, one of the topics that we will study in future. So what have we seen? We have seen what happens if you perturb your linear system, if your matrix or right-hand side vector contains small errors, how do they influence the solution? We have seen that that leads to the condition number, and we have seen that the condition number is a good measure for singularity, and the determinant is not. That concludes this video.